was reminded when when she told me I, she when she when Kathy gets excited, you know the Holy Spirit is at work. And so when she had that, I thought this could be fantastic. So I'm grateful for uh, your uh, saying yes and reaching out right away. And I hope this is a uh, just a moment of blessing for all of us. You know, I, I was recently chatting with. Um, as someone who was uh, involved in some spiritual kind of difficulty, and they had gone to uh, they weren't they weren't uh, they weren't born and raised Catholic, but they they went to a, a kind of another minister, and the minister told them that um, the age of miracles, the time of miracles, is over. That's for the Bible. Now we're in an age where God works differently, and He doesn't work through miracles. And they were sharing this with me, and I said, "Well, I mean, no, no offense, but <laughs> there are more miracles now, I think, than there are in the Scriptures, because this is what Jesus promises. Jesus says, "For those who follow me, to His apostles, to the church, you will do everything I can do, and you will do greater things than I can." And we either take that seriously or we don't. And so I'm, I'm always uh, edified. It's not that miracles are not the reason we do believe, but they confirm that Christ is living and the spirit is living and alive in our midst. So to have someone who's been very up close and personal with the direct intervention of our Lord through the saints, it's just, it's so exciting. So thank you once again, Kevin, for being with us. And I'll just, let, let's just have a moment of prayer to kind of open our hearts and our minds to the Lord, to this story and to allow the same Holy Spirit, which has called us all to be his baptized people to truly touch us in this moment. So we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We just take a moment to recognize that we are in the Holy Presence, wherever we are, the Holy Spirit is with us, Christ is with us. Almighty and loving God, we thank you for the blessings of today. I give you thanks in a special way for all the ways in which you intervene in our life in powerful, blessed moments. I thank you for uh, your presence and your working in, in the life of Kevin and his story that he will share with us today. Open our minds and our hearts as we continue in our Lenten journey, always to seek you and in seeking you to find you and in finding you to open our hearts to share you with one another so that indeed we might set the world a fire with your love and your joy. And we make this prayer in the name of Jesus, the Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Michael. Awesome. And now I am going to turn it over to Kevin, the guest of the hour. Um, and Kevin, I'm going to um, spotlight you so that you're big for everybody to see, okay? Like that. Just tell me if you want me to take it off. <laughs> no, you're good. I'm going to, you know, now, it's just, now I know what it's like to be like, you know, Superman's father for a second. <laughs> but, um, well, before we begin, I want you guys to say hello to um, a piece of Giorgio's um, coffin, original coffin. Um, say hello. Giorgio's, so Giorgio's technically, his coffin's here. I don't know if he's, he's here with me right now, but I can confirm for you that he's saying hello to everybody here. Um, I think it's, you know, it's, you know, before, before um, you know, Father was talking about God and miracles, I think it's really, really interesting how God works. Um, when I was growing up, I was telling Kathy this like earlier this week that um, on every single report card, I got student talks a lot on every single report card. Even if it was a good grade, more times than not, there would be like student likes to talk a lot. And I think it's funny that God eventually set me up you know i don't think you know you i even recognize that fact god was preparing me to speak and do things like this after my miracle and stuff like that also i, I find it pretty interesting that i don't norm um obviously sitting down and talking is like something I, I just you know i'm used to standing up and talking um and two years ago or a year ago i, I spoke in uh, austria and the way they had it set up you know I was trying to just say, hey, I want to, I would like to stand up and talk. I'd much rather stand up, even though you have a translator. I'd much, I feel much more comfortable standing up and sitting down. Um, but they, you know, they confirmed me like, I'm, you know, it's just a lot easier for them that if I sat down. So I did a talk sitting down, like at a church. And I find it very ironic that due to COVID, you know, with Zoom, I'm sitting down and talking and thinking like it prepared me to sit down and talk. So, you know, if I were to stand up in the Zoom talk, I'm like in a basement or something. I don't know if I could do that. It would be kind of weird, but I think I got, I was playing jokes with me. It's like, all right, you're going to sit down again too and talk. So I, I found it very, very funny that I'm doing, you know, A, I'm talking 
And two, I'm sitting down doing sharing my testimony, which is something I didn't really picture ever happening. But here we are. You know, it's been a, it's been a fun year for some, it's, but um, we're all getting through it. Um, but uh, you know, I thank you for having me speak, and um, I'll get into it. So, as right now, uh, we are we're coming up on the the 10 year anniversary. We're about let's see August, so we're getting close. Um, we're almost 10 years to the day where I got hurt. Um. Before I got hurt, um, I was a soccer player, I'm still an athlete, but um, I went to, where I got hurt was at East Stroudsburg University. Um, I transferred to East Stroudsburg University from Nassau Community College. I played soccer there for two years. And then my first year at East Stroudsburg, I was an on-campus student. And I met, you know, a bunch of guys that played club lacrosse. And um, after my first year at East Stroudsburg, um, I had two of my friends asked me if I wanted to move into a house with them. And um, I said that would be, one of the best things ever. Um, I, there was no way I, I was going to survive on campus at East Stroudsburg University. There was um, no way. I was, I was, majority of the students that live in the dorms are younger than me. I was a lot, you know, I was a year older, two years older. Um, There's a lot more restrictions. There's just, it was just never going to work for me. Um, so I, um, I said yes. Um, I, conf I asked my parents. They thankfully said yes. I mean, I, I don't think they were going to, you know, say no to me, but, um, I was, you know, granted, you know, the permission to live off campus. Um, if anybody watches the YouTube video at some point, you will get to see this house and my parents will talk about how much I love this house. But to be quite honest with you, it wasn't really the best of houses. It wasn't actually a very good house in, in general, but it was like my, it was my, you know, my home. I called, I made a joke that we lived on a street called Lackawanna. So I called it the Lackawanna um, Resort because like we knew we were gonna have friends over, we were gonna host people and stuff like that, we're have people stay over. So I called, you know, my joke was, I was calling it the Lackawanna Resort and, you know, still is the Lackawanna Resort, even though I'm no longer there. But unfortunately the Lackawanna Resort does have a very bad, it has a bad moment and then it has a great moment. Um, but all, during that whole summer while I was, you know, slowly but surely moving in, um, you know, me and my friends, we, we, you know, me and my two roommates, uh, Joe and Nick Skoski, we spoke about how it was going to be an awesome year. You know, we, we were just, we were getting prepared. We know we were getting the house ready. We were just, uh, you know, we were just very pumped. Like, we didn't, nobody in the world that was um, connected with me, you know, you know, you're just thinking you're in a normal life. You just never know what to expect. And um, on my, you know, for the first week, you know, we, school's about to start, you know, about three or four days. And, um, you know, the Thursday night, August 25th, 26th, um, we, you know, we decided we we're gonna have friends over, we have teammates over and we have, you know, have like a little, you know, welcome back, you know, celebration and things like that. And, um, you know, you never know what's gonna happen. Uh, even, you know, earlier that day, I told my mom how I was on my roof. My room that I picked was, um, had a roof on. I picked that room because A, in um, Pennsylvania, you can, you get a good, like, where, at least where I was in uh, Pennsylvania, the Poconos, um, you get a good, like, um, when you go on the roof, like, when it's, like, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, you get a pretty cool scenery, something that you don't, you don't get in New York, especially, like, where I am, like, you can't really, you, you really have to travel to get, like, a good scenery, so I chose that room, A, for the roof and the scenery, I don't know, you know, something, something about, you know, something I still learned, but, like, there's something about a roof that vent, like, this, I guess has students and young people's minds like we got to go on this roof and stuff like that. So that was there. Um, and I was just telling her like earlier that day, I was trimming like the tree on our roof um, because our cable guy was having trouble getting the wires in there. I don't think I really needed to trim the tree at all. I just think I did it just out of like spontaneous, being spontaneous and stuff like that. Nothing happened, but like it, it, it just showed is just, you know, one of those things where I did, but, um, Later, you know, we had the, our friends over, cable was up, um, everything that you could have is set up. Um, now, and, you know, eventually later that night, you know, I told my friends, hey, I'm, I'm going to sleep. And when I guess I, I, see I went to sleep, at I, I couldn't really tell you. I think I went to bed like at 11 o'clock. Um, and I guess about, you know, 30, 30 minutes later, 45 minutes later, that same night, uh, my friend Brian, who was leaving the party, saw me 
on my on the ground lifeless um, on my back and not in good shape um what must I guess what happened was i um what definitely did happen is um, i fell off my roof about 45 minutes after i told my friends i was going to sleep um and about a few minutes i would say about maybe 15 20 25 minutes later um my, at that time my my girlfriend alexis called my parents and um they told them hey um your kevin's really badly hurt he's um on his way to the hospital luckily this is this is how crazy that like on how god works um a when i was on the ground none of my friends that went outside they didn't touch my body they didn't move my body or anything like that so that is was very very um essential um my friend brian leaving the house when he did leave the house was huge um the hospital that the, the first hospital i went to it was maybe five minutes away from where I lived. I mean, it's like maybe a mile away. Um, so to every single step leading to get me to that first hospital, it's, you know, you couldn't have set up an injury any better the way than I did and, and choosing where I chose where, where to get hurt. Um, but they got a phone call from my girlfriend and they said that he's, you know, really badly hurt and um, we, but we don't know much more. Um, so I got transferred, you know, taken to the po um, Pocono Medical Center and from there, um, the doctor, you know, they they got me, you know, stabilized and stuff like that. But my injuries were so severe and they didn't have the Pocono Medical Center, didn't have a trauma center graded for my type of injury. Um, they called, you know, they spoke to my parents and they told my dad, he's um, saying like, he's, you know, seriously here, but we're gonna have to transport him to another medical center, Lehigh Valley Hospital. And my dad was just like, okay, um, how, you know, how badly is he hurt? And he just said, and the doctor said to my dad, you know what, I don't, we're not sure if he's, he may not make it to the next hospital. That's how badly hurt he is. So, um, and, you know, my dad was like, oh, because like my dad asked, like, should I wake up my children? He goes, yeah, you, you, he may not make it to the next hospital. So, unfortunately, oddly enough, usually they um, air transport patients. Um, with the injuries like mine, but for some other, you know, there's a, like a hurricane going on in uh, New York uh, around the same, around the time I got hurt. So they couldn't do an air transport. So I had to get, it was a ground transport. Um, so it just meant a little bit more, you know, a little bit longer for me to get to the hospital I was going to, which is about like, I guess if you're going ambulance speed, I guess it's like an hour away, maybe, but if you're not going ambulance speed, maybe it's like an hour and 30 minutes away. I don't, um, but that, that you know delayed things a little bit and um so my parents got you know the worst some of the worst news of their life um at that time period um my grandmother was dealing with stage was dealing with cancer she was in the hospital um my mom's brother he was severely ill he was also in the hospital and you know i just laid you know i just put the the, the cherry on top and you know now i'm in the hospital but i'm and not very good, like I am very close to death at this point. And um, you couldn't imagine how tough things were getting for them. And um, you know, my parents, my dad goes upstairs, he wakes up my older brother who's here. Um, my older brother grabbed his, um, his rosary beads. I, know, I think my parents say in the video, they didn't realize that my older brother had rosary beads, which is, but that's besides the point, which is pretty, like my dad started laughing about it. Um, my little brother was a, about was about to be on freshman in high school. He was going to a Catholic school of Kellenberg, and he was actually in the midst of a preseason for football. And um, he, you know, he grabbed his pillow, which is okay. We we're, we we will forgive him for just wanting to grab his pillow, and also saying that he's just he's Kevin. He's going to be just fine. He's going to, you know, he didn't. He's young. He no, he didn't know how badly hurt I was. I don't think anybody realized how badly I hurt I was. Um, my dad, he grabbed his Bible, his rosary beads, and you know. Probably sports mag sports illustrated magazine and a couple newspapers that's what he does and um my mom you know she grabbed her our lady of guadalupe statue her rosary her beads and they, they got in the car and um in the front which is interesting this is how great like how much time has changed they got in the car and they didn't know how to get to where they were going they had like they just got in the car and start driving you know like they didn't like i don't think they you know 
they no Google Maps or anything. They just got in the car and they start driving and then realized they need to stop and figure out where they were going. They went to a gas station and, um, you know, they got themselves settled and things like that. Finally, we get to the hospital, um, Allentown, Lehigh, that's where it was in Pennsylvania. Um, the doctors, you know, they speak to my parents. They, they told my parents that, you know, I'm stabilized but I'm also in grave danger. Uh, at that point, they, they learned that I um, fractured my skull in five places and um, I severely traumatized my brain. Every single one of my brain was severely damaged. So, so not good. Um, I, was, I was already, you know, already in a coma, already there, already not, not, in, not winning. We're, right now we're losing. We're losing right now. But um, the good... As odd as it sounds, I was, I was telling Kat, Kathleen is if there's anything about my injury, I kind of did a good job of, of injuring myself. Um, the fracturing of the skull was like one that was like a very, very, very good thing. And even though it didn't sound like a good thing, it was actually a pretty good thing. Because um, it allowed this one doctor to perform a, a surgery, which you know, basically the whole point of the surgery was to get a, like a tube or to reduce the swelling in my brain but also to measure like what, how, how my brain was doing. And because of the, the fracture, they were able to perform this surgery. It was a tough surgery and, and things like that. But because of the fractures, it, it allowed the doctor to perform, you know, even give a chance. And the surgery was successful, which, which really helped. Um, they were able to measure my brain, the, the swelling, you know, they were able, it was able to help reduce the swelling and things like that. Um, and Catherine, if you want to, you can show a, the picture of me in the hospital. This is, basically what I looked like on the first day. Okay. May not be, maybe like day seven, but pretty much um, as my cousin Max Becker would say, it looks like I had more wires to me than a circuit city. I don't know if the, you, if uh, California has circuit cities, but that's what my cousin said to my, <laughs> um, so that's, that's what I looked like um, pretty much for a couple of days. And, um, so on the first day, you know, nothing much. Second day, you know, not much improvement. Third day, not much improvement. Fourth day, not much improvement. Fifth day, that's when things got pretty dicey. Um, on the fifth day, one of the doctors went up to one to my brother, who's here, and my father, and basically just telling him. Him like, hey, you, you know, you guys can't do this anymore. Um, on the fifth day, wasn't was not a good day for me at all. Um, I wasn't, you know, I used to say I was trying too hard um, to get back, but um, I was running a fever. I think my fever, I was running a crazy fever. Um, my body was um, sw swelling up. Um, I had a thing. I had pneumonia. Had a sinus infection. Pretty much, my body was was getting ready to tap out. And uh, the doctor told my father, like, we, you know, this is what we can do. You know, we can keep on doing this or we can put your son into a, a medicated coma, basically to really settle me down. But the problem is like, the second, the going into a medicated coma, there's, there's, you know, if that happens, I'm pro, I'm definitely not here today. I probably, I'm just going to go. I, I'm pretty positive. I wouldn't be here today. I can't, you know, can't play, you know, time switch and figure that out. But um, things that was not a good day. Um, and my brother being as mad as he was when he heard that, he actually took a, you know, took a hospital chair and kind of tossed it in the hospital at one point. He had to, you know, everybody had to calm down. My dad was very unhappy. Everybody was unhappy. And uh, it was very, very funny. One of the doctors or one of the security guards went to my brother and my father. And this hospital that I was at, it's, it's the next level. It was a next level hospital, top notch. Um, but they're still building and the security guard showed them like a staircase to run up just to like calm down. So they, you know, they found a staircase for them to calm themselves down. And so they would run up and down these staircases every single day. But um, nothing, you know, on the fifth day was a bad day. It's kind of like, if we're talking World War II, day five is like, day five is like Pearl Harbor. All right, that's like, what gets us into the war. Um, but on, um, you know, a few, two days later, my cousin, you know, things didn't, you know, change. Uh, my cousin Beth, who um, is the one that 
started this novena for blessed pair Georgia Rosati. She's also a nurse and, and um, she's a very, she's a medical professional also. And she, she got um, notification on what my injuries were like. And she knew right then and there um, when she got them that I was not, that this novena needed to start like ASAP. And um, she knew that um, blessed pair Georgia needed a miracle. The whole family needed, you know, obviously needed something. And they started novena. And uh, believe it or not, she um, also sent a picture of Giorgio overnight. I don't know where that picture is. I don't know if it's in my house. I think it's in my house. I don't know. I haven't seen the picture. Usually when I go out and speak, I bring a big bulletin board. And then I'll, I got this, um, you know, the, the coffin, the piece of Giorgio a couple of years. And I bring this with me all the time also. Just got to keep a close eye on this thing. Um, but... So Novena, picture, so on the seventh day, picture gets mailed. On the eighth day of my coma, the picture of Georgia Rosati is put next to me. My eyes open up. On the ninth day, I'm awake. So on day five, doctors tell my parents I'm in bad trouble. Like I may not make it. Four days later, Georgia Versailles picture, I'm awake. A day later, I'm asking for my mom. They, um, they take me off the breathing assistance and all this, and I'm asking for my mom. Two days later, uh, you know, injuries as severe as they were, it's them telling my parents that um, chances of me making a full recovery, pretty much zero. Chances of me want, you know, being able to walk again, pretty much zero. Um, them telling, you know, they tell my parents that, you know, pretty much just gonna, we're gonna start from ground, you know, start from the beginning again. Um, on the 13th, you know, day 13, I'm asking my doctors if I can stand up and walk. On the 13th day, I'm, I'm standing up and walking. Uh, a few days, you know, a couple of days later, I'm being transported, I'm being moved from the, you know, ICU to 24 hour care where I'm not as in much care. Um, but it was still in 24 view, but I also had roommates. And this is this is kind of actually funny. Um, so this is like maybe day 15, day 16. I have you know, two roommates and my my cousin. At this point, the whole Becker family is basically in. All my cousins are in. My cousin Beth, who's from Cal, she now lives in DC, but when I was her, she actually lived in Sacramento, but she flew in. And I went, you know, she was saying hello to me. And I was, you know, kind of kind of the there, getting, I was getting there. But I asked her, I'm like, hey, cousin Beth, like this is like, you know, 16 days. I'm like, hey, cousin Beth, did they send me here to die? Like, because they put me with two roommates and my two roommates were senior citizens. And like, I had still had no clue what was going on. And uh, one of the person sitting across from me, I forget her name, but she always asked for her husband, like, where's George? Where's George? She um, had fallen off her roof. Um, my other roommate, I have um, no clue. I don't, I think she, I think my other roommate may have passed away when I was there, but I was kind of freaked out. I was like, did they send me to die here, cousin Beth? And she's like, no, 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 they didn't, they didn't send you, no, no, you're fine, you're fine. But um, you can see that right away that um, cognitively I was speaking a lot. Um, I was walking around the hot, you know, the floor that I was on, I was walking around the whole time or as much as I could. Um, I was able to take, you know, within, you know, on day 16, day 17, I was taking a shower brushing my teeth, doing all, doing all the basic things. And one of the doctors, his name is Dr. Dubob. You know, I had, him and I had a very good relationship. I was, I joked around with him a lot. He was, he was a big Jets fan. So I just kind of made fun of him for being a Jets fan. But um, he recognized right away, like when I woke up, like on the 10th or 11th day, that I was healing at a pace that he had never seen before. And he wanted to get me into inpatient therapy as quickly as possible because he knew that he he was just scared that if I went to outpatient therapy, I may not um rec you know I was gonna recover, but may he was hoping that keep keep me in inpatient therapy to get me like the top of the line care and stuff like that. But um I was feeling too quickly. And also when they were trying to get me in inpatient therapy, I still was, you know, still recovering from my fever. I was still um still a science infection. And I still couldn't swallow food. And that was the biggest, um, I always tell people the biggest scam of the test of all time. I had to like swallow food to like get me admitted to inpatient therapy. And because like, I got so badly hurt, I got like, you know, my swallowing wasn't good enough. So like the water and stuff like that, they were afraid that I would get like um, 
pneumonia and stuff like that. So I wasn't able to transfer into inpatient therapy when they were hoping for, but I did. Um, so I had like on the 18th day, I had to perform a couple of tests. So um, how to do another, how to do a test where I had to sh show people that I could shower and um, brush my teeth. One problem with that was I, when they were asking me to do that, I had already showered and brushed my teeth earlier that day. And I was kind of frustrated. And I just said, I'm like, why do I have to do that? I just, I already proved that I like, I already did this earlier today. Why do I have to like, go in there and show like the shower again? I'm like, I'm like who showers twice within 30 minutes? And that's why I said to them, well, who showers like twice within 30 minutes? You're like, and I'm like, Kevin, you just have to do this because to prove that you can do it. And I was like, okay. So I did that. Um, then I had to do a cognitive test, which I did not do very good on. Um, couldn't tell you, I couldn't tell you what a llama was. There's a llama picture. I couldn't tell you what a llama was. Um, when they asked me to put letters, like so three words for one letter, I couldn't do that. And what was very scary was um, when I did wake up from my coma, I did swear a lot. I mean, I, you know, like it was, I guess it's like one of those things where you, you swear a lot when you wake up. I, I can't confirm that or not, but that's what, and I definitely did say some choice words here and there. And um, they gave me the rather, like one of the letters was F. So right away, my parents were terrified that I was going to say the one word, like just drop, you know, just, just put the, you know, sign it up. And I, instead, I didn't do that, but I couldn't, you know, I couldn't put three words together. So I actually, the words I said were football. So as an American football, football as in European football, F-U-T-B-O-L, and then Roger Federer, because I was watching the U.S. Open. So I said, football, football, and Federer. And um, the doctor started laughing and goes, Federer, is that, where'd you get that from? And my dad's like, he's watching the U.S. Open right now. So like he, but that's that's where my brain was on day 18. Wasn't fully with it. Um, I definitely had like my my wits with me and my, my humor. Because um, another part of that test was like, um, what do you do? if there's a fire in the kitchen and I said to the, to the doctor, I was like, well, it depends on how big the uh, fire is in the kitchen. And he goes, why? I'm like, well, I'm like, if it's like a small kitchen fire, then I can surely just put pour water on it. I'm like, now are we talking about a kitchen where I need to call the fire department? Cause if it's a big fire like that, then yeah, I'm going to call the fire department. But let's really hold. I was like, I think if it's um, small enough, I can pour, you know, pour out a fire. And he goes, well, that's, he goes, that's a right, and he goes, that's two right answers, even though it's, it's the wrong answer. He goes, that's, he was, he was just like, you could see that you're, you know, you're getting there. And then um, the final test was the, was a physical test. And um, if Kath, I don't know where, if you had that set up, Kathleen, if you want to show a quick, um, this um, at physical test I did was pretty impressive because not only was um, I asked to perform physical activities, but I was also had to re remember everything that I was doing. So when I was doing this, before I started doing these um, acts, the um, Elizabeth here. Um, I'm gonna, there we go. She um, was performing these tasks beforehand. I had to remember it. So basically I, I'm this old memorization and also finding a way to um, not knock myself out. And if uh, Kathleen, I can, can tell Kathleen a few mm -hmm. weeks ago, my hair was like this there long, actually a little bit longer. I actually got a haircut today, so that. <laughs> Trying to skip through to that. There we go. <laughs> okay. So, and what um, Elizabeth or Beth, who's a, this is like the nurse, who's, that's not my cousin, but this is like who's um, training me. Um, when I completed this, she basically said, this is like one in a million um, based upon my injuries and things. She goes, I've done this test with a lot of people. And she goes, I've only seen three people pass this test, but she goes, but I've also never seen somebody with your son's injuries be able to perform this ever. But um, everything I was doing here was all based upon memorization. Um, I had to remember each step and things like that, which is, um, and once I passed this test, this is when we were notified that I was going to be sent home. Um, I was being going to be exiting the hospital. 
happened on my uh, on my final day, you know, my final morning there, I told my mom that uh, that there was an angel with me when I was in my coma. And um, he kept, I'm like, he kept me safe. And she couldn't believe it. So on the on my final day at the hospital, between um, telling her that, you know, and she's like, we'll eventually get to that. Um, you know, she was hit with something. And, uh, you know, I did a few things at the hospital that um, I made sure that I was going to do. Um, I walked I walked out of the hospital with my bags. You know, I got to like maybe like 100 feet before the final doors. And I told the transporter, like, hey, I would like to stand up and leave the hospital. I'm walking out of here. And, um, and then, as you know, we're leaving the hospital. You know, we, we're racing. We're trying to leave the, you know, I was trying to get out of the hospital before my older brother sprinting um, through the parking lot to there's a like a, basically a hotel it's called the Hackman's Pat's house it's where my parents stayed while I was hurt we we're trying to race to get to the front door first um, I don't know who won that race uh, Dan did you beat me when, um, did you, were you at the front door before I walked out most likely no nah. so we, we got in the car um, we had to go back to the pack, Hackman's Pat's house to um, pack you know pack up and while, you know, my parents were doing that, um, my older brother and I were, were throwing a football. Um, Kathleen, if you want to jump to that picture real quickly. So this is on the 18th, nine, you know, my, we're, we're talking like 18 days later, I'm throwing a football. I'm, I'm having to catch my older brother with a football. Um, not sure if that was the, um, the safest thing to do, but um, as you see, <laughs> My parents were, you know, were still stupefied that I was um, even leaving the hospital. Uh, my mom, you know, was she was almost like wanting to put make me like a bubble boy, but here I am throwing a football. It's a good job, mom. You know, so let me not do that. But um, throwing a football. Um, we get in the car. Um, we go to East Stroudsburg. We go back. To, we go back to the site where I got hurt. We had to go to my room, pack, you know, pick up some stuff because we weren't really sure when I was coming back, I mean, you know, we weren't sure if I was going to be able to come back later that year. So we just had to pick up a few things. And, um, while we were there also, we, um, while I was in my coma, my, you know, my whole lacrosse team was there and stuff like that. All my friends were there. They, um, they were, they were pretty thrilled the day that I woke up. Um, they, the doctors told my parents, like we, you know, when I woke up, my, they told my parents like, Hey, you probably shouldn't tell his friends or like tell his friends, but like, don't let them come. And my friends were like, um, my friends, you know, they couldn't help, help themselves. So like they, they're at the hospital every single day that we, they probably, they gave my, you know, my family a lot of comic relief. They got to see, you know, the good, you know, the people that I, you know, mad and stuff like that. But when I went back to my school, I went to my team's lacrosse practice. They, I don't think they knew I was actually leaving. I know like a few of my friends knew that I was leaving the hospital, but I don't think like the whole team knew. So they're all kind of like stunned. They, they, they gave me a very humbling, you know, moment, you know, they, they were clapping and stuff like that. And in the meantime, like while we were, you know, we were hanging out, you know, I just picked up a lacrosse stick. It was, it was like, it was new, normal shooting a lacrosse ball. Probably another thing I shouldn't have been doing, but still it happened. But um, we're on our way home. Um, we're on our way home. Um, and I couldn't have been more thankful to be home. I won, I wanted to leave the hospital really badly. Um, I don't think I would have, been a very happy at inpatient therapy, even though that probably would have been better. Um, I had to leave. Um, but, you know, I like to tell people that I was uh, allowed to leave the hospital on good behavior. And I don't think I, I had questionable behavior. I think I was a, more of a jokester than I was a, on good behavior at the hospital. I would like to have a lot of phone people. And, you know, I was off home. And uh, the next morning is when, you know, the fun, you know, just the, the true fun begins because that's when my mom finally gets to learn about Mr. Per Giorgio Versati. Um, so the next morning, we, you know, my, they didn't really tell my parents what to do with me. Like when we left the hospital, it wasn't like, um, well, he should do this, he should do that. It was kind of like, the, there wasn't no, you know, book for dummies on how to uh, tend to your child who had just fallen off a roof 15 feet high and had still had fractured skull and his brain was still recovering. It wasn't like, this is what you should do. This is the way. It was kind of like the, you had to test things out so like I was joking beforehand I'm allowed to throw a football and shoot a lacrosse 
you know, and play a little lacrosse, have a cash. My mom, but my mom wouldn't let me play video games. But, you know, I was just joking around. So I'm allowed to, fl- allowed to throw a football, not allowed to play video games. Okay. I don't know why, but sort of joking around about that. But um, we knew that the doctors just said to keep me mobile, keep me walking. Don't, you know. So where I live has a, you know, we were, our plan was just, you know, we had a dog. We believe it or not, we had a dog. Her name was Maggie. So Brandon, this dog's only been with us for a year. So she's kind of like a pup. So first of all, I'm gone. My parents are gone for a couple of weeks. She's, you know, she's only lived with us for a full year and she's being transported back and like, she was at my uncle Fran's house for a couple of weeks. She was back at our house. So she was kind of in shock and she's a lab and she's a, you know, she, she loves to love. She's a big, she, we like to call my, my grandfather, rest in peace. He would call her the human love dog. She loves people. So like when I got home, that first night in the hospital, usually what she when she says hello to you, she says hello to you. It's like a hip check. She's she's decking you, you know. And she knew right away that I was hurt, and she didn't do that. She kind of came up to me very nicely and things like that, and was very happy to see me. But we were told to walk, so that's the next morning. That's what we did. We walked her, and we walked around this block that my house was on. And it's not a very long block, like this block. If you're walking around it, if if you're walking, I get just like a simple pace. It should it should take you 15 to 20 minutes to get around. And I, 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 I'm not joking. It took us about an hour or so to get around this block because my family was well known. Um, my my grandfather was the mayor. Like we we're we we're well known. So when I got hurt, there was an article written about it in our in our village herald. And when the article was written, it was like a, I think the paper was released a week before I came home. So everybody, for, so for all, you know, little Lindbrook knew was I was in the hospital and I wasn't doing too well. Um, and a week later, I'm walking around the block and a lot of people who knew who I was saw me. And they're like, holy moly, like this, this can't be real. Like you, we just saw, you know, it's like, we just saw you in a newspaper. Holy mackerel, like, are you like, I, so while I'm trying to tell my mom about a pair of George Versace, you know, nice, could have been like a nice little 20 minute, no, you know, quick short story turned into, you know, an hour long Giorgio commercial break. Hello, nice to meet, nice to see you. Um, you know, um, one of my neighbors, Dr. B, who's like the, you know, one of my, you know, great principal, he was a principal when I went to school there. He, very devout Christian, was, he, when he saw me, he drove by, he heard his car, hear the brakes, and then he turned, he goes to reverse, gets out of his car and hugs me. He goes, holy mackerel. Like he couldn't, he couldn't believe it. Like he, he just could not believe it. And um, it was, it was a weird experience, but as I was doing that, I was talking about Georgia with my mom and I was telling her, um, like, you no, know, what I have in memory now, like what's what, thankfully I still have stored in the, the noggin of mine, or I guess you say are, are good, or just like the most I can remember at this point. But I was telling her about how the first time I met him. So, when I first met him, when I was in my coma, like my dream world, world I don't know what to call it. Let's call it, I'll call it like a piece of heaven. I got like, a, I didn't get the full heaven experience. I got a piece of heaven. I got like, you know, I got a, a cake and I got the only got like those, the small little triangle case. I didn't get to eat the whole piece of the cake. So I got the piece of that, I got that small piece of cake heaven. But um, when I was in, when I was, when I met Georgia, it was like I was at my, my college house. So um, when I, my first experience with him, I woke up the where I where I was it felt like I was home um I was I was in my college room um for, my college room was the most college room of all time and when I said most college room of all time I used my closet as my dresser but it actually did have a dress like ironically enough like I had like a dresser type of thing so I could put my clothes in there but it was a college room um my closet was my dresser. That's always told like if you want my if you want to find clothes, just open my closet. Boom, clothes are probably gonna fall out a little bit. Um, futon. Um, I had th- I had a, I had flags. I had a TV. Had my Xbox. Had a TV stand. Most makeshift TV stand of all time. But that is what I woke up to, like when I was in my coma with Giorgio. And um, as I can you know co- inner circle people always say, I'm usually the first person awake. And um. What caught me off guard by this was somebody was a week before me in my college house. And um, where I lived, like uh, in college, um, Laxalon Resort was also not a very safe street either. Um, 
I, um, my next door neighbor, his, his now I was, I became very good friends with him, but his, his nickname, when he introduced himself to me, because I introduced myself to him when I first moved in, he called he introduced himself as Kenny Two Piece. So that's what you can imagine. Um, when you walk outside my house, like my dad will say, like, yeah, we found some things outside Kevin's house that weren't very promising. So I wasn't like in the, in the safest of places, but I made good friends with my next door neighbor. And it looks like that guy was a very important person to make friends with because nobody ever messed with our house, which, which was fantastic. But that, and so like when I heard noise, I was like, all right, it could be a burglar. Um, uh, you know, if there's somebody, you know, I, don't, I haven't really been introduced to some like many bigger people. I felt confident that if there was a burglar in my house, I'd be able to handle him. Or, you know, I yell, my friends wake up, we're all, you know, the guy's in trouble unless he has a weapon. Then, then we're all in trouble. But that wasn't the case. Um, then, uh, you know, get down there. I'm like, all right, maybe it's one of my friends. You know, we did have, you know, we are the last one on resort. So maybe one of our friends stayed over the night. Or it just could have been, you know, the last thought was the fact that it could have been like a vermin, you know, maybe a, ra a raccoon or something got into our house. I mean, I wasn't really sure. But as, you know, making my way down the stairs, I see this young man. Um, and as I will, as my brother will confirm, when I told him when I first met him, I told Damien that I was bigger than him. And Damien will say, well, yeah, you are a lot bigger than most people. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, you said you thought you were older than him. And I also saw it. Because you were bigger than him. Yeah. And I said, maybe you were just bigger than him, but not older. Yeah, I thought, I thought by, because I was bigger than him, I thought I was older than him. That's where that's where I was on the 19th day of my coma experience of the waking up and stuff like that. That's where we, that's where, that's where we were click, clicking on. Um, young, you know, young guy, no, didn't, you know, didn't, wasn't wearing any sort of, you know, 1920s clothing or anything like that. Just a young, he looked normal, Kevin, you know, that's what I saw, saw Georgia. And I, you know, I go to him, I go, all right, who, I'm like, who are you? And he goes, I'm your new roommate. And I go to him, that's impossible. And he goes, and I was like, I already have, I'm like, I have two roommates. So their names are Nick and Joe. And he goes, they, they are not with you right now. I'm, I'm your new roommate. And I was just like, okay, all right. You're my new, you're my new roommate. I'm like, I'm Kevin. Who are, who are you? And he goes, I'm Giorgio. And I go, all right, Giorgio. Nice to meet you. And that, from time on, my time in the peace of heaven was my roommate. My, he used to say he's like my new roommate for, for life, but um, he was my roommate. And um, what was interesting was um, the things that I did at while I was in my peace of The one thing I can tell you is um, it was like a, ever, once one really long day, it wasn't like, there was no, um, there was no sunset, there was nothing like that. It was, when you see like, when you hear about like the bright lights, like when you hear about heaven or when you're passing where you said the bright light, that's what I saw. It was like, but just something a little bit different than that bright light. It was, there's was a peace to it. It was a comfort, um, not really ready to go back to that bright light, but I can tell you it was pretty cool. You know, it's pretty sweet. Um, it was nice. But um, Wallace didn't have it. I think he, George Rose's plan was to keep me as occupied as possible from, I'm not sure what his plan, initial plan was, what, what the goal was. Um, I have two theories, but I'll, I'll get into that a little bit like very soon. But um, he kept me occupied. Um, while I was with him, we were doing housework which is something that you will never hear me ever, ever say. I know, wild, crazy, college kid doing housework, not real, especially Kevin Becker doing housework, not possible. Maybe there's other people that are my age or guys that are doing housework. I wasn't doing housework. I can confirm that. So that was a, that was a shocker. Um, we we're also building like the perfect room. Um, it's going to be the best room. This also the most epic hangout room. Um, I was also doing schoolwork too. A lot of housework, I was also doing schoolwork. Another thing that you would never hear me say if there's kids listening, just, you know, want to mute this, this, forget that I said that, okay? <laughs> I wasn't doing schoolwork. I, I was, so I was doing schoolwork with him. <laughs> I was doing, I was studying and stuff like that. And then as like a break, um, he would allow me to play video games. Um, so I was allowed, to, he was allowing me to play FIFA and stuff like that. Uh, I never, he never played me in FIFA. Whenever I went to like do my own thing, he didn't like hang out with me. He was kind of just, 
downstairs doing, you know, this used to sit doing his own thing. I couldn't really tell you what he was doing downstairs. But he was also he wasn't with me when I was playing video games either, which is probably a good thing. I would I think if we were to play video games, I would beat him, but don't know. I don't know. But um eventually I was like, it's time to leave. Like I had to leave this house. Um I, I know like all of us, we've you know, we've had you know, we had to deal with quarantine this year. So and telling Kevin Becker to stay in the house is not the thing you you do to me. Um so Back in 2011, telling me to stay in the house, you, you're going to get the same response as you were in 2020, 2021. I'm not, it's good luck. I'm going to get out of this house. So eventually, I got angry. With, you know, I was a little unhappy with Giorgio. Um, I wanted to leave the house. So I, you know, wasn't trying to sneak out. You know, just from what I can remember, my, you know, I'm, you know, about to walk out the front door. Um, my hand is on the doorknob and he stops me. And he just looks at me and he goes, you're not ready to leave. And I was just like, okay, well, when will I be ready to leave? He goes, I'll let you know. And that was it. Um, I don't remember, you know, ever really waking up from my coma. Um, there was no, I'm sure if like Hollywood got a, got like, um, got my story and like trying to make a movie of it, they would probably try to make some sort of like cinematic, like masterpiece. Like, oh, this is how, this is what happened when Kevin left. Like he he just, you know, floated out or something like that. But there was, I didn't get that. Um, what I can tell you is like when I first woke up in the hospital, um, my first true memory in the hospital, I remember like every single day, like while I was in the hospital, I could speak about pretty, you know, carefully, was I saw a robot, a cleaning robot in my hospital. And that kind of scared me a little bit too. Like I had a cleaning robot in my room and I was like, what's going on here? Like, that's like, that was like my first memory. That's what was going through my head. Like, whoa, what's going on here? Like, um, so there wasn't um, like a, an ending where it wasn't, I didn't get like a goodbye or anything like that. Eventually, you know, woke up. Now I basically told this, that whole scene, there's probably more to it. My mom wishes like it's, you know, they like recorded a lot more that I spoke about. And even with Damien, um, cause like when I finally got around that block, she came in, Damien had just gone home from a, uh, garbage he was uh, at that point he was just working for our village department of works public works and um she was like tell damien about georgia so you know and she goes i'm gonna go i have a picture of this of this guy that and i think you may have been talking about him and i want to show you this picture to see if i can see this if it's a confirmation so uh, while she's going upstairs she's you know i'm telling damien about this this dude that you know i thought i was old and i was bigger than and all those other things like things that we did and the one thing that he brought up, which was pretty interesting, was when I when I woke up from my coma, like when I was in the hospital, I spoke about schoolwork. I was talking about I had to get back to school, got to do go to schoolwork and stuff like that. I, I was talking about things that I was doing with Giorgio when I woke up from my coma, which is which was pretty wild to hear. Like we, like the, he like told me, was, "Oh, that's interesting because you actually spoke like mom. Remember Kevin was talking about schoolwork when he woke up from his coma? Like he has to go to school. Like he has to get back to school. So like I was doing." A lot of weird things that you just couldn't imagine. Do you want me to say? Do you want me to hop in and say what it was? Yeah, well, I don't even know what to tell. Hey, what's everyone? So uh, I'm Damien, Kevin's older brother. He, when he was first coming out of his uh, comatose state and waking up, he kept saying to us repeatedly, he goes, you have to break me out of here. That's it. I need to get back to my house. Um, there's a new roommate. I don't want him to take my place. Um, I need to get back to playing FIFA. I have to do my schoolwork and I need to get back. You have to get me out of here. You have to get me out of here. And he just kept repeating it, repeating it. There was, it was nothing else. It wasn't like, Hey Dame, good to see you. It was get me out of here. And he had the most concerned look in his eyes I've ever seen in my life. But, um, yeah, he, he didn't know what he was talking about. He's like, I have this new roommate. And I was like, you don't have a new roommate. Don't worry, Kevin, no one's taking your spot. Yeah. And that, that, that was that, but I didn't, I, to that point, I had no idea that there was uh, an angel with them yet. So. Yeah. so those are, so those are things that like, I can't coherently bring, like, I just forget to bring those things up sometimes. Like I can't do it accurately. Like they have like the accurate stuff sometimes. So my mom's coming downstairs with this picture and um, it's the picture. So the picture she's bringing down is the picture that my cousin sent. So it wasn't, it's the same picture 
funny thing about this picture is my cousin just it wasn't like you know you didn't like she didn't like go on like um the internet and like buy it you know she didn't buy the picture just like a print you know it's a simple you know print out picture of it and put it in, in a photo case and things like that and now it's like i don't know where it is it's very i guess but it's it's a it's a, a photo worth um a lot of you know worth a lot because it but um she comes down and she she shows me the picture and um i told I'm gonna. I'll just try and keep this as you, you guys. Everybody can just use their imagination. On what I said. Um, I'll just. I'm just gonna keep a G, maybe PG. I see the picture, and I just go, "That that's the son of a gun." And my dad is the son of a gun. I'm like, "That's the guy that that was with me while I was in a coma. That that's my. That's the angel, and that you know that is the guy." And um, what's interesting is my mom. At this point, um, we we're. My mom was already, my mom and my cousin were already getting in contact with like Versati USA about like how we think our son had an intercession with George Versati. And um, Versati USA got messaged her back saying like, if, it, if we think it's like, you know, Giorgio's, if we think it was Giorgio, then he, Kevin must make it known. Like it must be go through Kevin. And she wrote that like a few days earlier. And on that day, she got her message that she was looking, you know, my mom got her message for Saudi USA at that point, you know, they got it, but it wasn't like they were focusing on my story just yet. But, um, I still had to get back to work. I, I still was recovering. We're only, you know, only 20 days in post-injury, um, had to, had to go to outpatient therapy. Um, and I would say that outpatient therapy was pro, you know, one of the cool, Humble, it's very humbling. I used to say it's very, it's very interesting. Um, I was, um, my story, Kathleen, earlier this week, um, when I got hurt um, about a month earlier, um, a kid, um, one of my friends who I played soccer with, he was a few years, he was two years younger than me, but um, we played on the same high school soccer team. For, and um, he was also in a really bad car accident about a month before me. And he was in really bad shape, you know, severe, you know, very close you know, to death shape also. And um, on my first day of outpatient therapy, um, he was actually go going to outpatient, him and I were going to the same place for outpatient therapy and it was both our first day. And, um, you know, we're, you're in, you know, we're in the elevator and his mom is there and you know, my mom's with me. And on that, like, you know, we're talking, you know, like I'm 25 days post injury at this point, maybe a little bit longer. But on that day, I knew like that I was, so like in much better, much better shape than him. And I would, I just couldn't believe it. Like, I just, I, I felt bad for him, you know, like in his mom and his mommy was like saying, she was Jimmy, you already have your Kevin back. You, she goes, you can see Kevin. Like you, he's, he's, he's fine. Like I have Jordan, you know, like he's nothing there. And like, and I could, you know, um, it was weird. It stunk. Um, and I, for, you know, as of, as I know right now, like the last time I'm, I saw him, um, we, we used to do like um, alumni soccer and stuff like that. We didn't have it last year or this year, obviously due to COVID. But um, what I do know is he wasn't, he, the last time like I saw him, he's doing good. Um, I think he has like, his short-term memory isn't the best, but um, I know it was like, really, like when it first started with, like when we saw him, it wasn't like his mom had to like, make sure like on a daily basis, like they were putting notes and stuff like that for him. So he knew that he, you know, did this and did that and things. But um, like while well, I was in outpatient therapy, it was, it was tough. Um, it was weird that um, a lot of the students or his fellow classmates that I was with, you know, some of them had, you know, not as severe injuries as mine, but they had been in outpatient therapy for, for a year. And I was already, you know, kind of in a better in better shape than them. And it was, it was, it wasn't fun. Like it was fun, but in the aspect of like, it was very sad, like humbling. And I was like, Kind of like saying to myself, what did, what did I do to, to uh, get this grace? Like, where, where did this come from? What did, what did I do differently from everybody else in this room and everybody else in this world that um, has stuff like this happen? I was like, this is, um, like, I couldn't really figure it out. But um, I was still going to um, outpatient therapy. And, and then about a month month into it, I had to take, um, like, a cognitive test. Basically, just measures where... I was cognitively to um, my age group, like if I had taken a step back or anything like that, I had to take a very, you know, a very long comprehensive test. 
And um, usually, it's, you know, it takes from when I was meeting with her, her name is Dr. Nicola. We we can't find her. We we need. She would have been good to um help out when it came to sending my story to the Vatican. She would have been like a really important figure. But um, she told you know she told my parent, my mom, and I like when I was going to take this test with her that it's gonna take like you know a few hours, like you know two or three hours, and and she was like, and you know we we're just going through my head injury and stuff like that. And she she couldn't really believe like how bad like she didn't. She couldn't believe that I was really that badly hurt because she, she saw how I was performing compared to like the other students. Like she, she was like, oh yeah, you know, yeah. he was in a coma and like kind of like that, not like in a mean way, but like she, she didn't really know how badly like um what I was coming back from. Uh, I don't think like a lot of the some of the, I, some of the doctors couldn't believe it, but um, she she got her you know she got her you know her doc, her medical papers and she got you know she she learned, but while you know I'm taking this test. You know, I'm flying through it. Um, one of the, I used to say one of the most impressive feats. I don't, I don't think I could do this again. I'll be quite honest with you. But um, one of the part of the test was like she show you a pic. I'll be shown a picture, right? And she did this for a lot of the pictures. Like I, I think it was like 50 pictures. Shown a picture, and then she put out a second picture. And I wanted to pick which of the four figures, which picture was the right picture that was just shown. Um, I think I went 50 for 50 on that test. Um, I didn't get a single one wrong, and she, like it was like when we were told, like I, I couldn't believe it. You know, I wasn't told like oh it's the right picture. Like it was out there, you know, once we had the results. But um, a month later, so October 11th, I took the test. November 11th is when I get the results from this test. And the first thing that this um, Dr. Nicolay, she looks at my mom on this day, and she goes to my mom. She goes, I owe you and your son a, a major apology. Um, your son, I can't, she was, I cannot believe that, like, you, how badly, how severely injured your son was. Um, she was, I, you know, I didn't know, you know, she, five fractures. Um, she was, your son severely injured every single lobe. Um, and, and then she pointed out that my brain shifted a little bit also, which is um, like, you know, we're just kind of this put to, you know, this on like something we didn't even know. They didn't even tell us this in Lehigh Valley. Like we had no clue this, this part, this was kind of like a, actually a surprise. I was like, whoa. And um, she was like, I can't believe like you, your son was this badly hurt. I'm really sorry. Like, this is unbelievable. Like, you know, like this is, she was, this is a miracle. Like, this is what you see. And then she sees me, she looks me in the eyes and she goes, so Kevin, how do you think you did on the test? And I will tell you this right now, I'm, I always will give more times not the same answer for how I did on a test. I will say I did good. I think I did good. I think I did okay. I had no clue. Um, it was a pretty tough test. It wasn't, it was, you know, wasn't, you know, fun, but um, she looks at me and she just goes, Kevin, you did amazing. You did, you, she was like, I can now tell you right now that you are the person that you were before you got hurt. You are, you're there. And she goes, you can, she goes, you can go back to school. And um, that kind of, you know, was on, um, you know, the one thing that I put my mind to, I was like, I gotta get back to school. I, I was like, my goal from day I, you know, when I woke up and like got my goals set together, like my job was like, I need to get back to school. I need to get back to each, wasn't going back to Nassau Community College. I was going back to East Chester University. And I even told like one of the, the doctors at the um, outpatient therapy that I went to, like the first day, I'm like, my, my goal, she goes, so what are your plans, Kevin? I'm like, my plan is to go back to school and, and go back to East Stroudson. And she goes, we'll see about that. We'll, we'll probably, you know, more or less, we'll probably go to the NASA Community College and take like two or three classes and stuff like that. That was not a part of the plan. And I, I was given that gift. Um, I was back, going back to East Stroudsburg in the spring. The interesting part was when we got the results, we just we had the rush things because for to sign up for the spring semester in Strasbourg, it was like maybe a few days beforehand. So like my mom and parents had to get on the phone with like the school admissions and stuff like that. But hey, it's come, you know, because once we got special treatment, but we definitely got a little special treatment to get me back to school. And um, I was going back to school in the spring, and um, I about a month later, I had finished outpatient therapy. My final month of um, outpatient therapy. They, uh, they actually said they elevated the class. So um, 
I find it very interesting how you know God just does really, really interesting things. Um, the classes that I, so I went into the new class I was in was with um older people, but they're all um dealing with either Alzheimer's or dementia or sorts of stuff like that. And I found that interesting because um my grandfather, who I lived with, my dad's father, he was just just had just entered dementia. So I kind of got um uh the best of both worlds. I got to see what, you know, what's about probably bound to happen at some point. But um, while I was in this final class, they were, you know, they were kind of joking around. Like the first day I was in there, one of the, one of the, um, the guys just goes, what are you doing here? You're, you don't need, you're too smart for us. You need to get out of here. Like I was, I was just, I was just too quick. Like, you know, they're just making jokes with me. They're like, they're trying to like one of the nurses, like what, why is Kevin here? We don't need Kevin. Kevin is in the, you're, he's, he's like, you're wasting his insurance money. Get him out of here. <laughs> just like joking around and stuff like that. But um, that was my final month there. And then about in January of that year, or New Year, I should say, um, we went to we went back to Lehigh Valley just to get another medical check. Um, we did, you know, they're um, they're still amazed. Um, they had seen me early in November. My parents of uh, 2011. We did like a a donation. We donated like a bench to the Hackman Pat's house, and on November, they couldn't believe how well I was doing. Um, but in January, still same thing. But on January, we have gotten like the news that I didn't actually. I actually was uh, prepared to never play sports again. I don't know why I was thinking that, but I, that's where my mind was. I was like, I'm just, "This is it. I'm never gonna be able to play sports again. Be able to do you know simple exercises and stuff like that." But I didn't think I was ever gonna be allowed to play sports again. Um, on that day. I was told that um, a my skull was fully healed. Um, I had six, you no, know, had five, you know, bunch of fractures. Uh, the doctor told my parents that his his skull's healed. Um, it usually takes about six to twelve months, I guess, to for a skull to fully heal. And my my skull healed a little bit quicker than I expected. And then uh, we were also told that I'd be allowed to play sports. So in August 2011, you know, August 26, 2011 nearly, you know, fell off the roof, almost dead. A uh, couple, you know, six, seven months later, um, I'm being told that, you know, I could play sports again. So didn't, I didn't hold back. Uh, I was back, I was back to playing, you know, right away, first week back at school, playing, you know, intramural basketball, um, playing, um, you know, got back to playing lacrosse, um, take, you know, that life was normal. Everything, everything was back to normal. Uh, there's a little, you know, a little defense, you know, um, if I did get hit in lacrosse, or even if it was a, you know, a light hit, teammates were, you know, were ready to, you know, drop the gloves and make sure that the other team knew that, you know, and stuff like that. There was, but um, life was normal. And, um, and then, you know, about a year later, um, that's when my story kind of got some notification. Uh, there's a priest, his name's uh, Father Charles Mangano, one day he he gave a homily and he, he spoke about my story at his homily. He spoke about Giorgio Versati. He had a huge devotion to Giorgio Versati. And uh, at this day, on this at this mass's homily and stuff, um, there's people, um, there's two ladies that we we're family friends with who had this, you know, I guess God's, you know, God's plan. Um, they went up to him and said, hey, we know this Kevin Becker. And he was beyond himself. And um, eventually um, we got connected. Uh, he had a TV, sh he was on a TV show on, um, it's, in New York, we have a tele, we have telecare. Um, he had a show called uh, God is Good. So I was on his TV show, God is Good, about a, a month after he gave that homily. Um, after eventually I graduated from college, um, I graduated in five years. So one more, one you know that one year the one semester that um I missed a semester and then this the semester I came back from college I didn't take like any classes that were even remotely close to what my 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 major was so it's kind of like I took I get extra gen ed which I didn't need to take so I kind of took gen eds I didn't it was more or less like a test round like to see where how I could handle um four classes to see like if I was here and there but um eventually when I graduated, he, 
he made it, he decided to have a huge event and he made, had, um, had a statue of uh, George Versace built. Uh, it's on the internet. I like to joke around. I, I, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's the only statue in the United States of George. I think it's like the only statue of George Versace, like in the whole world. But I like to joke around how it's like not like the quote unquote pinpoint accurate version of uh, looking of George Versace, but it's there. It's, um, it's there, but um, he asked me if I wanted to give my first ever testimony. And I would say this, this first ever testimony was like probably the most important testimony of all time because um, at this point, George Versace did not have any more. He had a miracle before me that there were that the Versace USA group was trying to push as the miracles. Um, I think she was a nurse. I'm not sure she was either a nurse or not a nurse, but some oh no, she she had cancer and um she healed from that like in a mir miraculous way. And um there I guess it just wasn't working. Like this wasn't like the story itself didn't have, I guess Versace USA couldn't push it anymore. I guess either the Vatican turned it down or something like that. But my, but this this testimony for me was really really important because if I had said certain things during my first ever testimony, um, I probably wouldn't. I think I'd still be speaking. I just don't know if my story would have as much traction as it as it does. Um, but um, when you see like with George Versace, it's like blessed Pierre George Versace. If I were to ever have said during my first testimony, blessed Pierre George Versace, Pierre. If I just a Pierre, right, Pierre Giorgio. No, no, would never. Would, I would not be here. She would. I uh, would have been turned. Um, would have been turned down. Because um, when I gave my first her testimony, the first time you would say her name is Christina, or Christine. She was there, and if you say Pierre, if you say Pierre Georgia to her, she gets really, really unhappy. So I actually just do that to her now whenever I see her, just to get her aggravated. But um, at my testimony, you know, I spoke. I said what I, you know, I told the story that I saw. I, I didn't, you know, change, you know, I didn't add Pierre George or anything like that. I kept it, kept it to the crew, to the queue, kept, you know, I said what, you know, and she used my story, you know, my story was next up, as I like to say, or she would like to say, and it's gone, it's taken me to places that um I never could imagine. And um right now my story is being looked at by the Vatican. It's been at the Vatican for about five or six years, they have about 50,000 pages worth of medical records. And, um, you know, all I can say is, you know, if God was able to do this for me, imagine what God can do for you. It's been a tough year and God's very active. I continue to say this, he's active when you don't even think about it. Like right here, me sitting down on a Zoom call, I never thought I was gonna be sitting down doing, doing a talk, a testimony about George Versace. I always figured that if I wasn't gonna be sitting down, it'd be like an interview or something like that. But God does very funny things, and um, I thank you for having me. And um, if you have any questions, ask away. And if you have any questions for Damien, you can ask him. And I think, I think I, um, my aunt may be in here too. Um, my aunt Terry. Um, so if anybody's, my aunt Terry is also in here somewhere. I think. Um, so if you have any questions for her, I'm sure you can um, and ask her as well. Um, but so if anybody has questions, ask away. Um, and I did usually I answer. Usually when I do talk, I do answer one of the questions, but I figure that I just leave this part out. I just, I'm, maybe I'll get it, maybe I won't. It's kind of like my uh, test. I get asked this one question at every single testimony or speech I give, even though I, I tell them the answer during the talk, so. Thank you, Kevin. Oh my gosh, that was so amazing. Such a great story. So many more details we got today. Um, yeah. I did think like when you were talking about how you were doing housework and your homework, I was wondering, yeah. was it your mom's heaven and not yours <laughs> as a mom? But then I thought, well, maybe Giorgio is just uh, trying to help you be your best self, right? Yeah. And you, you went back cool. to school. Giorgio so, was uh, also, you know, if everybody, anybody does like their research on Giorgio, Giorgio was a man of all things. As he did he did everything. Um, he was an athlete. So it's not, you know, everybody said that was like the perfect, you know, I wouldn't say I'm the perfect miracle for him, but like the, the thing, the similarities that you would you would look for in the person that would get into session were there. Um, Giorgio was an athlete, loved to hike. He was a huge, you know, he's a huge mountain climber. I'm not a mountain climber, which is okay. I don't really need to mess with that stuff. That's very fun with heights. Um, but athlete, he was a you know, he was a jokester. Um, his prayer group, which was known as the Tuli Lipso or something like that, he mm -hmm. 
I think he named it that way as like a way to troll the church when he was in the 1920s, like a, a joke. But it was also, you know, the, the you know, devotion to God. He loved Mary. Um, he was a saint for, you know, he's a he's the Dominican, he's a late Dominican. Um, he's a saint, you know, Vincent de Paul. He he loved the poor and things like that. He he was everything. Um, awesome. Well, Thank you, Kevin. Is, I know, and I love that he's late Dominican. I'm in late Dominican, and we have a lot of late Dominicans here on this call from yeah. all over the West Coast, I think. Um, I just wanted to point out. I never really knew that much about Blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati. I know that my former confirmation coordinator is here, Megan Osborne, and she is a, calls him her heavenly boyfriend. But um, I did get these books. Yep. I, I think I got three books about him. <laughs> and then I just fell in love with them. And I got this book is written for like high schoolers. Yeah, that's, the, that's for children. Yeah, um, if I gave it to all my confirmation kids. Yeah. But, make sure with that that book, the one for the children, the, the, the heights the kids one you gave uh -huh. make sure, tell them that it's kind of like a non-fiction fiction book so some of the stories in there are not accurate stories but some of them are kind of close to like what he did but um that's definitely like a good book for high schoolers and pretty much anybody um that yeah. can that's able to read that's a good book Awesome. Thank you. Okay. We have a lot of questions already. So what I'm going to do is if you have a question, raise your computer hand because there are 60, well, we're down to 63 people on this call. Um, and then there are also questions in the chat and I'll ask that to you, Kevin. And then if anyone wants to just send it to me because they want to ask anonymously, that is fine too. So I'm going to call on, first of all, I'm going to call on Megan Osborne. Um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you because your testimony is amazing. And mm -hmm. I'm like Giorgio's biggest fangirl on earth. So Great. just having you is like a gift. Um, thank you. And so thank you. Praise God. Um, but my question for you is how do you see him interceding for you? Or like, how has he been working in your life recently since your accident? Um, we, you know, I, I like to say we have a, an, I have an interesting relationship with George Jones. It's kind of like, I have a brother. So it's like, I get to, so he's with me. Um, I was, there's a lot of things that I do now that I would never, never could imagine. Um, first of all, doing speaking like that was something that I don't think I ever envisioned myself doing when I first got hurt. Um, it kind of, you know, something just gave me the, you know, when I was invited to speak that first time for the testimony, something felt felt good um so i think that he gave you know there's a little push right there and also i i do say like i'm an athlete but like before i got hurt i wasn't like um there's something i do now that i would never have thought i would ever do so like i always mention that giorgio is a hiker he loved to climb mountains and stuff like that um i run like marathons now and that's like my adventure with him like that's something that i was never really doing and now because i feel like just because of him something like gave me like this itch to um travel around the world but and then also um there are some interesting stories because like that I've heard because of me speaking. Um a few one year, I guess I spoke in a fam, I guess like family of some of my testimonies and they saw me and they said that like their mom who passed away, unfortunately, but like on her final days was like the most peaceful five days of her life. And she was like very she was there and she was just saying like how she was dancing with this young, handsome man and like and they're like saying like how that could have been Giorgio and stuff like that. And I was like, that's a very good, I'm like, that could have been. Um, I spoke in Houston a few years ago and I, the person who hosted me, she wanted me to go over to her cousin's house, I think. Is it her cousin or something like that? Where she was having a really tough um, pregnancy. And um, we did like a huge, and they weren't sure if the baby was going to make it or her, she was going to make it. And we did like a, a really, you know, nice, awesome prayer session um i did not bring this the statue to some this guy with me he the georgia does not get to go in the plane so he, he stays home he only gets to go on on car travels but um she had she likes to uh, test like her her birth and everything like that was perfect to my prayer and like that when i was with her it was like you know there's something heavenly about it so it's just like he he's with me but i I send them out to work just like he sends me out to work. So if he's with me, then I tell him that he's not doing a good enough job. And it's just like the same with me. And so that's, that's like our relationship. He's, I know he's with me and I know like when I need him, he'll show up, but right now the whole world needs him a lot more than I do. And so I'm, especially right now, like with Italy and, and like when Italy first got hit, I was like, George, you gotta go, go home, go, go back to your, go back to Turin, man. So that, that's where I, he's with me. But, um, 
I'd rather him make sure he's doing more things so I can continue. You know, we need, if I'm not the miracle, we need to find a second miracle. So that's, that's, the, that's the goal. Like that's always been my goal. If I'm not the miracle, hopefully by me talking, people will be able to um, share my story and maybe we'll get that two, you know, two miracles is better than one. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. Just a super quick yes or no question. When you were in heaven with Pierre Giorgio, or with Giorgio, sorry. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Did he have an accent? No, he spoke like a normal person. Okay. Like an American? Yeah, he spoke. <laughs> anyway. he, he, All right. He spoke, he spoke, he had like my, uh, my broken accent that I like to say I have. Oh, he had a New York accent. <laughs> oh, he, I don't even think he had a New York accent because he just like sounded like, he sounded like me. So my, uh, Damien and I, um, so we've lived like in New York majority of our lives, but for five or five years, we lived in uh, Illinois. So like we had like a, we just used to say like we have like a mixture of a New York, Illinois, Long Island accent, wherever you want. Like we just have a. a <laughs> Thank um, you. Okay, Damien. And guys, this is exciting because Damien is Kevin's dad and he is here on the call and he has a huh. question. Damien, huh. welcome. Are you there? Now, now I'm now I'm here. Okay, yay, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so uh just out of curiosity, Kev. What um as it relates to Pair Giorgio Frasati. Yep. Was he active uh in let's just say uh faith and freedom and as it relates to politics in in Italy yes he was very active <clears throat> and uh <laughs> that's a dad question yeah. <laughs> he's really but, active um he held he when he was growing up he was this is when um the church was basically under attack by um you know the Italian fascism and stuff like that and he Held group, you know, he had meetings and stuff like that. They um, they did um intrude on his house one time, and he did fight these uh, guards back and and stuff. And um, he he uh, Georgia was a man of wealth. Um, his dad owned the a newspaper. I think it's called the Gazette. I'm not positive. His dad was also a part of Italy an Italian embassy. So like they um he his dad they had two houses. They had a couple houses that. A summer house at a house in Turin, and they also lived in Germany for a couple of years. So like he was doing a lot of, of things like that. But um, Giorgio always wanted to be, never wanted to work for like the newspaper. He always wanted to be working with the people. So like he was a man of the people. He was active in a, a lot of politics. He, he was not very happy if you ripped off the uh, picture of Mary. Let's put it that way. Don't don't mess with Mary around Giorgio ever. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Um. Someone asked, have you met any of his living relatives? I have never, I, it's just, I've met Wanda. So it's like, it's the last, I don't know if she's the last living relative. I've met her via video conference, like a few years ago, but that's about it. Um, when I, the plan was like, when I was in Austria, we were, we were trying to figure out a way to, so when I was, when I spoke in Austria, um, Christine, who was with me also, when I spoke in Austria, we're trying to figure out a way if there's a, any chance to like get me from Austria to Italy and get back, but it was just logistically just didn't work. Yeah, thank you. I've never okay. met her, or shook her hand or anything like that, but I've seen her, I've spoken, I said hello to her before. Awesome. Um, how many times did you see and speak with him? I think it was just when you were in the house with him, yeah. right? And then do you um, still hear from him? Um. Once I hear him, like, I, I never like, I haven't had like a dream with him. Like, I haven't had one of those. Um, I would say when I'm like running, is you like is when I get like the strongest sensation. Like, if I can kind of like, I can feel his presence. I can feel like, I get like this goosebumps. So like, I can be like 100 degrees outside, and I'll get goosebumps. Like, well, I'm down here. He is. He's, he's trying to keep up with me today. That's. But um, more you know, as I said, I'll just continue to say I hope. He's somewhere else. You know, if he's with me, that's good. That's excellent. But if, a lot of people need Georgia. So I'm, I'm, I don't, you know, I won't hog him from people. That's Aww. people can have Georgia. 
Thank you. And I love how you say he's trying to keep up with you. You're not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Terry Lynch, you have your hand up. That is, that's actually my answer. So. Oh, it's your uh, aunt. Yeah. Oh, yay. Yeah. Hi, Aunt Terry. I'm, I'm a physical therapist. And to see what happened here is I want you to know as an aunt is just. Oh, you muted yourself. Yeah, and Terry, mute. Yep. There you go. The witness of, of a miracle is one of the most incredible, remarkable things one can go through in life. And coming from, and I teach, I've taught physical therapy and clinical medicine at universities and um, worked with head trauma. And when my husband and I got there, we were able, I was able to also go on rounds and look at the, uh, the MRIs and the CAT scans, et cetera. It, I had, I've never in my entire career witnessed anything like what happened here. First of all, he walked out in 18 days. He, from what, and the fifth day, and I know my poor brother, but the fifth day was horrendous. Yeah. Horrendous because they were all making that decision to help us let go. Wow. It was one of the most horrendous days of our lives. And then of course came uh, the, we all started the um, Novena to Pierre as Beth, uh, we got the picture and, and we all, you know, got past, we all started reading about Pierre and, and, uh, but we all were saying the rosary and praying and never alone, Kev, you would never, <laughs> every no, single never alone. There. And so it was a, it's a, I just want to tell you, it's the most remarkable thing to witness is for a professional like myself in a career of physical therapy. I have to this day have not witnessed anything in any of my patients like I've witnessed in my own nephew and and that attests to the incredible faith in God that uh, we had possessed and shared at the time. And also the rosary and Pierre and this constant, yeah, so she, she brings in Pierre. So, okay, we'll do that too. <laughs> you know, yeah. whatever, you know, whatever it takes. And, and, and it was short of faith in some ways. We just wanted to get lucky. You know, I, it was faith too. You know what I'm saying? Because you, you don't know the experience of a miracle until it happens, but you don't think it'll happen to you. And then it happens. And then you wonder how can you continue this grace that you were given and uh, bring it on and just somehow, and then you somehow take it for granted, Kev. You know what I mean? After a while, yeah. okay, so it happens. Yeah, I wonder, God must get so frustrated with us, but he doesn't, he loves us, you know? <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I could just tell you, if you have you know, any questions about the medical aspect, but I was able to attend some of the rounds and it, it was a pretty dire situation. And, uh, and one that I had never witnessed, uh, witnessing a brain go from that to a full scan. It was, it, was, it was amazing. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And we didn't really know about day five that you were making those decisions. I think probably because Kevin was in a coma right on that day. But, um, but for it, both it of you, really... did, this, did this change your, and this is a question that someone had, did this, how did this experience affect your spiritual life and your relationship with God? Um. I like to, I, I think like my relationship with God has been pretty consistent before injury and after injury. Um, my, like, before I got hurt is like when I kind of started getting back into my faith. Um, before I got hurt, that my grandma was diagnosed with like stage, stage diagnosed with lung cancer. And, and I was like, well, this is unfair. And um, I started going to church more and praying to, you know, to God. I also started challenging God a, a lot before I got hurt. Um, sort of saying like, you know, it's a saying, hey, God, if you're just all, all almighty, this, this, and this, like, you, you, like, show me that you're actually there. Like, show me something. Like, show me something cool. Um, uh, like a really rude awakening of what's, what, what he was, uh, what God's plan was, because next thing you know it, I get this, I get to be the subject. And um, now it's just, I have, you know, I have a really, you know, a different, you know, same, you know, I still love him, still speak to him. Um, so question at times, but um, it's always been consistent. Um, and I try to encourage as many people to get back into their faith in a, in a non-forceful way too, because I know that if I want people to get back into God, God will come to them. Um, I don't like, but um, it's always been, I'd like to think that, you know, that God gave me the will and the, and the power and the strength to speak. Um, not, not a lot of people are are willing to put themselves out there. Um, so that's why I'm, you know, like you said, it's very hard to find me. So it's, I like to think that God's work is you finding, you know, it's people finding me on the internet and 
asking me to speak. So I always say to myself, this might be my last talk. And the reason why it could be my last talk is because I don't market it. But um, that's how God is working with me. God, God and I have a plan, just like George has a plan for me. And I like to think I'm doing, doing it my best right now. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Um, how did your family come to focus their prayers on intercession from Giorgio? Um, Dan, um, I think, I think so. Um, cousin Beth sent the picture. Yeah. So Giorgio needed, they, Giorgio needed, there, he's still blessed. Tenderly, you know, we can't, we can call, I'll, I'll call him a saint because, you know, he deserves to be a saint. I, I don't think. <laughs> I don't know if it works that way. I'll, I'll let the Vatican, if the Vatican's listening right now, I just called him the saint. He's still saint. He's a saint in my book, but um, he needs another, like he needed another miracle. Um, The whole, my cousin had a huge devotion to Giorgio. Oh, okay. Beth, and she started in Novena. And the whole, the whole thing was like, you know, Kevin and Giorgio, there's a lot of, you know, athlete, young, and the, um, stuff like that. Um, I think in the YouTube video, if I can almost quote it perfectly, yeah, okay. I'll, my, said, I, my niece Beth said <clears throat> she was aware that Pierre Giorgio Frassati needed a miracle, and she was fully uh, being in conversation with my, you know, even though she was in California with my wife, and she had a just like uh, my sister Teresa had a pretty fair understanding of what was uh, Kevin's situation and the direness of it, and so. She called and told my wife, she said, you know, Pierre Giorgio, Pierre Giorgio Fasadi needs a miracle and we really need a miracle. So let's start yeah. doing this novena. It's pretty much fine. It's with my own Susan YouTube video. Wow. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let me just see here. We have a lot of questions here. <laughs> I, think, I think there's a question in there about um, my story in the Vatican church. I'll, I'll answer that okay. for everybody. Um, so when I gave my first testimony at uh, Frasati, at the first testimony in Merrick, um, that's when um, the Frasati USA decided to um, use, you know, I used to you know, ask me if they, you know, they could use my story. And I said, you know, like, as, of, yes. Um, after that, we had to get put together a lot of um, documents, um, medical records, and then we had to get, um, solo papers from like each doctor that worked on me about like that what they saw and um they the all the all that stuff has been i guess went through you know the product i forget how it works like in the united states but it has to go through like person in the united states and then it gets sent over to to the vatican um it's been the story has been in the vatican for about six or seven it's been there for a while let's just it's mm -hmm. Definitely been a turtle race. Not we're definitely not definitely not a bunny hopping around right now. It's definitely a turtle that's rolling slowly but surely making its way. Um, and about two or three years ago, I think two or three years ago, um, the there was like word got to our friend Christine that they may not be using my story. So um, what we did was um, I went back to I actually got my 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 head like looked at for the first time since I had fallen off the roof. And to see like where where the recovery was, like if had a, if anything had setbacks or anything like that, and um, I was, you know not everything came back as it was you know as it was going to back normal brain was fine, thriving, and we sent those results back to the Vatican, still there. And now recently I got notification that there's a priest within the Vatican who's trying to push, is pushing my story now. And which I would say is um, very good news that a, now that somebody within the Vatican is pushing the story, hopefully, you know, depending on where the status quo of this priest is within the hierarchy of the Vatican, I think it's a good sign. Um, but I guess, you know, from, you know, if we look at the studies, like when it becomes canonization, it, do, it does take a really long time. We're just kind of hoping that right now, we. The church if there's a saint out there that that could you know it's a good a good sure shot guy i mean besides him i mean i mean there's i'm sure there's a lot, plenty of people out there but this is you know i would say a guy you want if you would want to see a saint Giorgio Pisati, um even though he's still he's still a saint in my book 
Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Um, someone else asked too, do you have any hints for us on how to grow in our own prayer life? Um, that's a question. Really. It's okay I, you know, if you don't. <laughs> I mean, I mean, any hints? I mean, I, you know, I would just, I, I like to say like my prayer life is set around like my, my physical activity, um, mm. running, um, that's like my, I like to say I'm praying. So like when I'm running, I'm, you know, it's, I'm usually running for like an hour and 30 to two hours of my day. So for two hours, I'm besides listening to a podcast and things like that, I'm like multitasking at the same time. Um, so that's like my prayer life. Um, I would just say, you know, keep God at the center of all your actions. So that's what Georgia says, which God, with God in your life, you have nothing to fear. So when, when it comes to prayer, just keep God right there. Keep God at the center of all the actions and, you can have nothing to fear. Beautiful. Thanks, Kevin. And then we have one last question, I think. Um, do you think others may learn to see or listen to similar new roommates in their lives? I love that. Are you ever afraid Georgia will not communicate any longer? Um, I'm, I don't think that's, he, Georgia's always gonna communicate. Um, I, I don't think he's gonna leave. He, he you know, it's like, is it, what's, I think it's like in Sandlot, he goes, <laughs> heroes may die but but just never pass away or something like that uh, george was a legend he's he's you know he's got he's the righteous you know he's, he's so righteous that he's never leaving um i don't think he i mean i know he won't be leaving me um we don't have a, a set time and date where we will finally meet again um he's I'm, you know right, right now his plans to keep me on earth so and that's the same with god i think if they both wanted me up in heaven they they would have done that a couple of years ago but um He's with me. I guess, was there another question that went along with that? Too? Yeah, there was one more. And it was, how can Giorgio be an example for youth today? And what can he teach them? Oh, he, he can see, I mean, everything. There's, I mean, he's a, I got a lot of examples for that. Um, you know, he, first of all, he's a, he was a man of the poor. You know, he, I guess in earlier, he, he was grown into wealth, um, born into wealth. Um, I, I don't, I think this is, this may be a fake story. I'm not sure. I can't, I, it's like, I, I, I know I've heard it, like Christine said, but like for his graduation, his dad gave him a choice of either money or a car. And Giorgio took the money and he used it on the train for the poor to get them out of the poor seats. Um, he devoted, the reason why he passed away at such a young age is because of all the work he did with the poor. Um, he was delivering them medicine all the time. And that's how he, he probably contracted polio. Um, he was so happy. He fought his parents to receive um, the Eucharist. And when the day he was given the Eucharist, he was so excited. Like the priest couldn't understand like why he was so excited to receive the Eucharist. Uh, he devoted his life around Mary. You know, he, he was a family person too. He didn't want to disappoint his parents either. Um, even though he wanted to, he didn't want to work for his dad. He wanted to do like, you know, form of engineering, like work with the people. He also was like, but I also want to work for my dad as well. And he knew that that was the way um, he was all about his family. Um, when he, and like when he did pass away, so he passed away like within a few days, like, uh, let's see, his grand, he passed away with like the same time period as his grandmother. And while he was dealing with his, with polio and, you know, that maybe if he did speak up, he, you know, he may have not have, you know, he may have lived, but um, because he didn't want the attention to be surrounded around him, he kept his illness to himself. And he, while the family was dealing with his grandmother, and then on the day when it came time for the funeral, that's when the whole, you know, family recognized that, like his mom recognized that Giorgio was not in very good shape. And um, because he was just that humble himself, like he just did not want the attention to ever be about him. And he, he, he was, um, it was everything. He's, he's got, he's like an endless example. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. He was very humble and you guys should all read his books, read up about him. Yep. He's, I'm, he's my new favorite saint, one of them. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, Kevin. This has been so awesome. What a great way to spend our Saturday morning. Um, for you, it's in the afternoon, I know. You're about yeah. to go eat dinner and we're going to have lunch. <laughs> but, um, Correct. Um, Father Michael, do you have any final comments and want to close us in a final prayer? Sure, no, thank, just thank you to Kevin. And it was not, not just you, Kevin. It was a whole family experience we got yeah. today. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, yeah. aunt, dad, yeah. brother. Yeah. This is what you know. Unfortunately, with COVID, COVID has given us this also this opportunity for all of us. Yeah, fantastic. Well, no, it did because it didn't just happen to you. It happens a whole. That's yeah. how the Lord works. He touches everyone. Yeah. Around around us, our families and and everyone you talk to. It's it's. I would I would expect that the Lord will continue. As you said, the Lord will continue to guide you and he's going to do his it's his work and you just you get yeah. to do your part <laughs> but the holy spirit continues to bless so i uh, thank you thank you for that um so we'll end with the thanks for everyone who joined us um we'll, we'll just end with a little bit of a prayer here so we'll pray in the name of the father and of the son and the holy spirit amen so lord we thank you for uh, the blessings of today we ask uh, that you continue as we continue our lenten season to that deepen our faith and our knowledge of you. We give you thanks for the saints uh, that you have put in our lives uh, to guide us, uh, to guard us, uh, to lead us reliably uh, to you. We ask that your will be done, especially if it be your will, that uh, uh, blessed Giorgio uh, indeed is recognized as, as one amongst the communion of saints, uh, that you would uh, continue uh, to open our hearts to be led by each of our patron saints. And that uh, I ask for blessings for Kevin as he continues uh, whatever ministry you call him to, give him an open heart to uh, proclaim your uh, miraculous uh, and uh, powerful presence in his life. And may we all uh, be open to not only receiving your blessings, but sharing them with others. And we make all this prayer in the name of Jesus, the Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed Giorgio Frasati. Pray for Pray us. For us. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Thank You're you, welcome. Kevin. And thank you, all of you, for joining today. It was so great to see thank all of you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for coming in, Terry. <laughs> Added a lot. And you guys, this will be available on our YouTube channel um, if you want to share it for people who couldn't be here today, if I can figure out how to send the recording there. But I, I will. Maybe St. Clair needs to help us there. Or Giorgio. <laughs> so... All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. No problem. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully the next time I speak, I can do it in person and in California. You know that? Amen. California California misses me. I know. I know that <laughs> I only got a, I only got a short stay. Yeah, you need a longer stay for sure. And uh, yeah. we'll have a beer together, I think, too, huh? All right. right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. It was